Hey there, my name is Ben Ferriolo, and I study seismic data obtained from stations all across the world to keep an eye on tectonic and volcanic hazards, and any precursor signs that could lead to eventual eruptions or large earthquake events. I'm making this video as a go-to information center on something a lot of my viewers on YouTube have been asking me about, spectrogram plots. This video is in-depth, so make sure you listen closely and use the parts section below if you wish to skip to any part of interest. However, I do suggest that you watch the whole video, otherwise you may miss out on some very important information. There's a lot of in misinformation out there about what spectrogram plots are, how they are generated, and how to read them. By the end of this video, you will hopefully be able to read spectrogram plots like a pro. They are very simple to understand, however there is one thing we must start with, reading plot labels. There's no way you're going to understand anything until you realize that you must pay attention to labels on any plot or chart first, and then read the data. If you don't, you could end up being deceived. Shown here are many different types of spectrogram plots from many different sources, some of which were generated by myself, and others were taken from the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network. Spectrograms are a somewhat new way to view seismic data. For example, the seismic program Swarm, which you see many people using more frequently nowadays, can only read data obtained from seismic stations. That's it. There is no such thing as spectrogram data. There is no such thing as seismogram data. There is only one thing that remains a constant, seismic data and the different options to view that data. If you wish to do what I'm going to do in this video, please use the description box below and visit the links section that starts with links for this video. It will contain two data download links, which I use for following examples, and will contain the download link to the program Swarm, which is what I use for the following examples as well. So don't just take my word for it, try all of this stuff out for yourself. Now seismic data can be viewed in many different ways, either by many lines, or otherwise known as seismograms, on a webby quarter or heli plot, like shown here, either by a seismogram plot or waveform plot, as shown here, either by a spectrogram plot, as shown here, or by a frequency spectra plot, as shown here. If you ever need additional help with these plots, please feel free to peruse my website, including the many pages in the how-to menu, which include a great deal of information on how to read these things and how to find data, and so on and so forth. Now, here we are at the PNSN website, pnsn.org slash spectrogram slash what is a spectrogram. Before I get to my explanation of what a spectrogram is, I wanted to use the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network's explanation, which is a very simple explanation. It's very good. So, what is a spectrogram? A spectrogram, or spectrogram plot, is a visual way of representing the signal strength or loudness of a signal over time at various frequencies present in a particular waveform. Notice how they come from waveforms, which, coincidentally, waveforms are what we see here in a seismogram waveform plot. Moving on. Not only can one see whether there is more or less energy at, for example, 2 hertz versus 10 hertz, but one can also see how energy levels vary over time. In other sciences that have nothing to do with seismology at all, spectrograms are commonly used to display frequencies of sound waves produced by humans, machinery, animals, whales, jets, etc., as recorded by microphones. In the seismic world, spectrograms are increasingly being used to look at the frequency content of continuous sig signals recorded by individual or groups of seismometers to help distinguish and characterize different types of earthquakes and other vibrations in the earth. Vibrations, guys, remember, vibrations. How do you read a spectrogram? Spectrograms are basically two-dimensional graphs with a third dimension represented by colors. Time runs from left to right along the horizontal axis. Each of our volcano and earthquake subgroups of spectrograms show 10 minutes of data, but in Seismic Program Swarm, you can manipulate how long the data is shown, and you can pretty much manipulate the frequency range and the color range as well, which you'll see in just a second. But for the PNSN spectrograms, they show 10 minutes of data with the tick marks along the horizontal axis corresponding to one minute intervals. The vertical axis on the left represents frequency, which can also be thought of as pitch or tone with the lowest frequencies at the bottom and the highest frequencies at the top. The amplitude, or the energy or quote-unquote loudness, of a particular frequency at a particular time is represented by a third dimension, color, 
with dark blues corresponding to low amplitudes and brighter colors, for example, red, yellow, and orange, correspond to progressively stronger or, quote-unquote, louder amplitudes. So that's their explanation on it. Above the spectrogram is the raw seismogram drawn using the same horizontal time axis as the spectrogram, including the same tick marks. Notice they have a very teeny tiny seismogram right there. With the vertical axis representing wave amplitude. This plot is analogous to web coordinate plots or seismograms that can be accessed via other parts of our website. This can be called a webby quarter or a helicorder, guys. If it's online, usually it's called a webby quarter. If it's offline, like on the seismic program swarm, usually it's called a helicorder. It kind of differs. Collectively, the spectrogram seismogram combination is a very powerful visualization tool as it allows you to see the raw waveforms for individual events and also the strength or loudness at various frequencies. The frequency content of an event can be very important in determining what produced the signal. That is very, very true. Why does each spectrogram page show several different spectrograms, interpreting spectrograms? Now, here are some examples. Here are some examples of local earthquakes. Very shallow magnitude 1.2 under the dome at Mount St. Helens. Normal high range frequencies. VT, volcano tectonic earthquake. Small 0 0.6 beneath Mount St. Helens. Go back. Now, since spectrograms take data, take the, take the seismic data from the waveforms, really, they're showing waveform frequency content, guys. The strength of the frequencies and at what frequency the strength was at right so that means it can show any single thing that a seismic station picks up yes even surface events because it has nothing to do with depth it has nothing to do with anything but waveform frequency content which still is extremely important in determining what is going on beneath our feet and let's see here's tremor non-volcanic tremor this would be ets episodic tremor and slip from multiple stations Notice that correlates on all stations. If you don't see something really correlating much at all on any seismic stations, really only shows up basically on one, it usually is not seismic. There are some exceptions to that, but usually not seismic. Here's an example of a calibration pulse right here from the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network. Don't know if you can see it very well, but calibration pulses are very, very obvious. Don't even look like earthquakes. Here's an example of wind. A tricky part of seismic monitoring is distinguishing between wind-generated vibration, seismic signals of geophysical significance, such as tremor. Wind may produce low-frequency continuous noise that looks similar to tremor, or it may be broader bandwidth bursts that could mimic an earthquake signal. There are generally two key differences between wind and tremor that usually are very easy to spot. First and foremost, tremor is almost always, says usually, but I'm putting in there almost always, observed on most or many of the stations in a geographical subgroup. For example, if low frequency volcanic tremor were to appear at Yellowstone, it would appear on multiple stations, not just the boreholes, not just YLT or not just YML. It would show on multiple areas because remember, seismic waves propagate away from their source like a ripple in a pond. Always. Period. Here we are seeing, at the Crater Lake area, a storm passing by. Notice how it, they do not correlate at all on surrounding stations at all. So it's always good to cross-correlate with multiple stations in the area if you think you have discovered tremor or an earthquake or anything. And always, cause, because you, in order to locate something, you need at least three stations to show it. So we see spectrogram plots are just another way to view seismic data. This means spectrogram plots can show anything that seismogram plots show. Surface events, local earthquakes, teleseisms, which are global large earthquakes, nuclear explosions, meteor airbursts, and pretty much anything else a seismic station detects. Any vibration that is recorded by a seismic station will be recorded digitally as seismic data and then can be analyzed via the many different plot options out there. Let's start with some of the mis misinformation out there. Do spectrogram plots record melt depth or any type of depth at all? No. If they did, they would show a depth measurement on the left right here, say in kilometers or miles. But that is not what we see at all. We see it clearly says frequency in hertz, not depth, frequency. And by the way, low frequency events do not mean they are deeper. 
there can be extremely high frequencies of events at some pretty deep depths and some really low frequencies from events closer to the surface. I will show an example of that in just a second. For the spectrogram plot, it shows frequency range vertically, and you can change it in the seismic program swarm to be from 0 to 10 hertz, or if you want it 0 to 20 hertz, or 0 to 30 hertz, depending on how far the frequency range is that the seismic station detects. Some seismic stations in the world only detect up to 10 hertz, but most stations detect up to 25 hertz or more, most of them. So yeah, it shows frequency range vertically, time period is recorded horizontally, and the color range you see is power. The color has nothing to do with gas, seeing that seismic stations cannot detect different types of gas, and the color has nothing to do with magma intrusion at depth. Because obviously, if a strong earthquake happens, let's say in Maine, or anywhere else in the world, you're going to see very strong power. And you'll see proof of that in a second. Now, real quick, it, uh, spectrogram plots do not show gas because seismic data does not record gas measurements. It's just seismic data from a seismometer. And everybody knows out there what a seismometer is. But there's an exception a little bit. Low-frequency earthquakes that are detected on multiple stations within a subgroup, for example, this magnitude 1.7 low-frequency earthquake at Lassen Peak, on June 11th, 2019, this was likely due to some gas release. Low frequency earthquakes can be indicative of, if there are multiple low frequency volcanic earthquakes, that could be indicative of magma intrusion if there are other high frequency earthquakes occurring as well. But if you only see a few of these every now and then, it usually has to do with gas release. A little bit of gas resonating through some unknown catalyst. That's what a lot of low frequency events are at volcanoes. So this was likely due to gas release at Lassen. But the thing you need to notice, it is not showing gas itself, right? But it's showing the effects of the gas, if it really is gas. I don't know exactly what caused this. I'm not a professional. But it definitely was volcanic in origin, because these are considered low-frequency volcanic earthquakes, which you will see in just a second. Now, I've come down to this earthquake right here because I want to show you an example of how the color range is not showing gas, it's not showing magma at depth, it's only showing power. But, on a spectrogram plot, you can manipulate how the power looks. Let me show you. Here are the wave settings in Swarm. Notice how, right here, I don't know if you can see it, it says power range dB, decibels. Power range dB. Maximum is 110 right now. Let's go down to 50. Check this out. Press OK. Wow. Look at how red that looks. Look at all that magma. <laughs> Just kidding. Let's go up to 70 power range. The maximum power range would be 70. Notice how it looks. still looks very, very strong, right? Well, let's go all the way up to 150 power range. It looks very weak now, doesn't it? Isn't that interesting? So again, let's go down to 110, which was what it was originally set at. Now let's go down to 80, which is much lower. But it's just, So the lower the maximum power range, the stronger it's going to look on the spectrogram plot. And so you can do this. I do this sometimes for strong earthquakes. Like let's say there's a 7.1, but I want to see the aftershocks right after the 7.1 on the spectrogram. Sometimes the power is so strong from that 7.1, you have to turn down the power a little bit and make it look a little bit weaker. Very interesting. But that doesn't do anything to the seismogram plot. Whereas, do not use the spectrogram plot 100% to judge strength of any given event. You need to use the amplitude counts on the left of a seismogram plot. Seismogram waveform plots are still more important than spectrogram plots by far. So now we see the color range really is power, strength here being recorded in dB, decibels. No, this is not showing sound. These spectrogram plots are showing the frequency of the waveforms versus the strength of the frequencies. Remember, however, sound itself is just a vibration. If an earthquake has high enough frequencies, you technically would be able to hear it. But let's see what the connection is between a high frequency earthquake and a low frequency earthquake. Always remember, however, Frequencies attenuate with distance, meaning if you are a great distance away from the epicenter of an 8.0, you will see much lower frequencies on that station than if you were to see a station right at the epicenter. That is why teleseisms, signatures of global distant large earthquakes more than a thousand kilometers from the station in, the, in question, 
carry some very, very low frequencies. Now, for this following example, for the high frequency event, I am going to use this earthquake here, magnitude 4.1. Notice I have it selected right here, almost directly under the center of the Olympic Peninsula in Washington State. 4.1 at 39.3 kilometers in depth at 1109 UTC on November 19, 2018. So let's go over here. Where to go? Where to go? That'll be this earthquake right here. Notice right here. Let's go to the date. It says right here, 2018, November 19. And notice November 19th, 2018 at 1109 UTC. So you can see this is obviously the 4.1 from the closest seismic station in the UW network. We're going to take a look at that. Obviously, again, color range is not showing magma. Let me change the color range power for you. Let's move it up to 170. Boom! Doesn't it look much, much weaker? Yes, you can change all of this in the seismic program swarm if you wish. It's just a different way to view data, guys. Different way to view data. Now, for the low-frequency earthquake, I'm going to use this event right here at Lassen Peak, right here, which is a 1.7 at 15.7 kilometers in depth. So, as you can see, it is much shallower than the 39.3 kilometers in depth for the 4.1, right? So, if low frequencies were showing that it's deeper, how come the low-frequency earthquake happens shallower than the high-frequency earthquake here? Notice that? Very interesting. So frequencies do not necessarily show depth, guys. They do not. So 1.7, 15.7 kilometers in depth, 1103 UTC, June 11th, 2019. Let's go over this seismic program swarm. I have the low frequency earthquake set out for Lassen Peak right here from LRR, which was the closest seismic station to this event. And notice the date. 6-11, June 11, 2019, at 11.03 UTC, the same time the event was reported at Lassen Peak. This is the low-frequency earthquake. This is the high-frequency earthquake that I am going to use. All right, guys, pay very, very close attention of what I'm about to show you, okay? See this plot, the spectrogram plot. First, we're going to go to the waveforms. Let's, let's start with the waveform plot first, shall we? Let's go to waveform plot here in the settings. It says zoom. Zoom would be for the plot right here. Let's see. Let me show you. 30. Notice how it zoomed out. So that's for that plot right there. Time range of this entire plot from start to finish is 20 seconds. Let's go over here. I'm going to show you this right here. Notice how it says zoom 20 seconds. So that means the start of the plot right here is from, oh, from right here. So right here is 20 seconds. So this seismogram plot and this seismogram plot have the same exact time range. Now let's go to the spectrogram. Notice the low frequencies of the spectrogram. Let's go to the spectrogram for the high frequency earthquake. Notice the high frequencies right here. Now why is that? Let me show you. It's showing the frequency of the ground motion, how often the waveforms pretty much peak, right? It says the sp time spacings are exactly the same, 20 seconds for each plot. Look at the waveforms right here. Do you see how spread out they are? Notice that from peak to peak, they are pretty spread out. Now for the similar time range of 20 seconds, and look right here. Notice how the wave much more squished, quote unquote, right? Well, let's zoom in one more time. Let's go to 10 seconds. Press OK. Okay, got that right there. And then let's go over here and let's do 10 seconds. There we go, right there. Now you can really see a big difference. Look how wide, how widely spaced these waveform spacings are. Notice from peak to peak, from peak to peak, from peak to peak. Notice that. But look over here, the high frequency earthquake shows much lower frequency peaks. Look from peak to peak peak to peak. So that shows you, look at that, remember? Waveform spacings very spread out, waveform spacings very squished. So frequency means the frequency from waveform peak to waveform peak. That is what frequency means. And the color range in the spectrograms you see is the power of that certain frequency. I know this is a little confusing and hard to wrap your head around. At first, when I was learning this stuff, it was pretty hard to understand. Just know 
that the lower the frequencies, the farther spread out the waveforms are going to be. The higher the frequencies, the more closer the waveforms are going to be to one another. I just wanted to say that. Notice high range frequencies going well beyond 25 hertz. Low frequencies barely even going past 6 hertz. Because this is a low frequency earthquake. And over here, this is a high frequency earthquake. I hope that helped you understand this, guys. I really do. Now, I want to show you an example real quick of what a teleseism is. Teleseisms are seismic signatures of large earthquakes typically above 6.0, recorded on a station greater than 1,000 kilometers away. So if a station was right near the epicenter, it would not be considered a teleseismic signature. But if the station that recorded it is 1,000 kilometers away or more, it would be considered a teleseismic signature. I want to show you guys an example of how frequencies attenuate with distance, meaning how frequencies get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller with distance. But usually it takes a great distance for that to happen. Many, 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 many miles. Now, I wanted to use uh, the 8.0 beforehand, but I think this one's going to be a little bit better for you guys to understand. Let's do the 7.1 at 46.7 kilometers in depth in Anchorage, Alaska. Pretty famous earthquake uh, on November 30th, 2018 at 1729 UTC. We're going to take a look at the data from the closest seismic station, look at the spectrogram plot, and then we're going to take a look at the data from a station down here in Yellowstone, which is many more than a thousand kilometers away. So you'll get to see the teleseismic signature and the local signature, but they're both the same event. And here we have data from one of the closest seismic stations to the magnitude 7.1 in Anchorage, Alaska. For your proof, here it says 2018, December 1st, which would be the end of the heli quarter down here. Notice it says December 1st. It uses the left side, which would be Pacific time, but notice that. 2018, 12.01, 0.500. And this would be 4 o'clock, so I don't know why it says 0.500, but that's what it is right there. 2018, December 1st, which is the day after. But we see the day before, the 7.1 right here. Let's go to MCID. Okay. Here we go. Notice 2018, 12.01, But down here we see 12.01 at 400. 0, 400. So scrolling up the day before, the 1st of December of 2018, we see this seismic signature right here. And notice we have the signature right here as well. This is the magnitude 7.1, unfiltered from a broadband channel near the epicenter in question. Notice the extreme high frequencies. That's all we're looking at here, guys. We're just looking, we're just comparing frequencies from one station to another. This was near the epicenter. Notice the high range frequencies. This station only records frequencies up to 20 hertz. But you can still see very, very strong frequencies. What I can do is I can make the power go to 150 instead of 110. And you can kind of start to see some of the aftershocks after the magnitude 7.1 struck. But let's put it down to 110 just for this example. Notice the high frequencies. Now, larger, much farther away than 1,000 kilometers, we have MCID, which is in Yellowstone. Notice the time that this earthquake started at Alaska from a local station. That's about 1729 UTC. You see 730 right there, so that's about 1729 UTC. Over here, we see the teleseismic signature from the 7.1. Again, I'm going to do 60 seconds for zoom right there. Actually, you know what? Let's do 60 seconds for zoom right here as well. So this is the same exact time frame as on MCID. The plot has 60 seconds from start to finish. This plot has 60 seconds from start to finish. Notice that? Okay, so let's go. So it has the same time range. Now let's do the spectrogram maximum frequency to 20 hertz to make it equal. So the spectrogram plots from MCID at Yellowstone and from the local station in Alaska are going to have the same exact settings, period. Same exact settings, 100%. Press OK. There's nothing different about these spectrogram plots. They're exactly the same, have a maximum frequency range of 20 hertz and a maximum time range of 60 minutes. Maximum frequency range of 20 hertz and a maximum time range of 60 seconds. I did not mean 60 minutes before I meant 60 seconds. So we see right here the frequencies are very, very low. Look at that, below 5 hertz. 
and we see the frequency or the yeah the frequency of the waveforms are farther and farther apart than they are on here notice that frequencies are a little weird here i don't know what is going on with this i think it kind of shook this station a little bit but the thing is you can see very some of these spacings are so close together you really can't see in between them but over here they are much farther apart and over here with much farther apart frequencies we see the frequencies are lower which is what we should see and when the, uh, the waveforms are closer together we see the frequencies are much higher sorry guys i'm just trying to not really dumb it down but i'm trying to make it so that even new people who are new to this channel and people who are new to spectrogram plots can understand this stuff as well so this is from a local station this is from a distance station more than a thousand kilometers away notice how the frequencies attenuate with distance but it takes a great amount of distance for those frequencies to shrink so that's it right now folks i really hope this helped some people sift through the misinformation that is out there about spectrogram plots remember they are simply another way to view seismic data from ground motion that everything from everything that seismic stations record they record frequency of waveforms vertically time period horizontally and the color range you see is power all of which all of which excuse me has been proven in this video but don't just take my word for it all of this can be proven for yourself if you utilize the seismic analysis program swarm which is by far the best seismic program available free to the public i will be back again soon guys and have a great day but remember to always test everything out for yourself again don't take my word for it don't take another YouTuber's word for it, and don't take the professional's word for it ever 100%. Always do some digging on your own. God bless, guys, and I hope you have a great, wonderful day.